Hello, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. I wish I could be in person in Grenoble, but to give a talk about entrepreneurship today, uh, what it is, what we can do better, and um, also kind of some comment on the current circumstances. Um, it is uh, the MIT Global Startup Workshop has been something I've worked with for uh, a decade now. And it's a terrific organization that takes um, uh, what we do at MIT out to the world and then gets a lot of feedback and then brings it back. So we're very, very grateful for it. But let me, let me just jump right in and talk about um, what I want to do in this talk. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about what is entrepreneurship. And I think that is always relevant and even more relevant today. Uh, before you start to solve a problem, the first rule of engineering is define your terms. So I want to talk about what is entrepreneurship, specifically from an entrepreneurship educator standpoint. Secondly, um, I want to talk about can it really be taught? Um, and that one and two are really intertwined with each other. And thirdly, I want to talk about how it should be taught. And then I'll talk about the social aspects. People ask about social entrepreneurship. And then I also want to talk about what, what, what's going on right now with the uh, global pandemic and how that affects entrepreneurship and how entrepreneurship can affect it. Um, so first of all, everybody talks about entrepreneurship and it is a cool thing now. And it's really interesting because when I graduated from college in 1980, um, no one even thought of entrepreneurship as a career opportunity. And yet now over 20% of the people listed as a career opportunity, which is just an incredible change. I should say career opportunity. The chosen career path they want to go on. They used to all be, people want to be lawyers, doctors, work in a big company, work in the government. But today it has to do with um, entrepreneurship as being an actual career. So let's look at what, what, what does that mean? Because um, people throw the term around quite a bit. And I believe that we don't really define it as tightly as we need to. And um, what entrepreneurship is, is the creation of new ventures that produce a product. And that product can be a replicatable service um, that creates value for someone. Um, and then they're able to extract value from somebody else. So it, in that regard, because they're able to do this, it is a economically sustainable organization. It doesn't depend on charity. It creates real value and then extracts real value. Um, so, sorry, there's something on my glasses here, just from this morning. Um, and uh, so that's what entrepreneurship is. Um, but I wanna, I wanna move beyond that that it creates new organizations where no organizations existed before. And I want to kind of dive deeper on that. Today, when I think about entrepreneurship, that was what I first started. We've got to produce startups. But today, no longer do I say entrepreneurship equals startup. That's, that, to me, is not what we're about. Startups are part of entrepreneurship. Um, but it is not the sole way that it, it that are the skills, the mindset, the way of doing business we're going to be talking about manifests itself. So um, today, entrepreneurship is much, much more than just startups. And really what our goal is to create anti-fragile humans. And by that, I mean, these are people who uh, management has been, you know, kind of getting people who optimize systems, who reduce risk, who make you know, create systems that produce predictable results. Uh, that by its very nature creates fragile systems that when they're perturbed, when they're disturbed by an external force or some adversity like we're seeing today, those systems tend to break. And um, what we wanna do is create people who are not, we wanna create people, we wanna create teams, we wanna create organizations and ultimately a society that is not fragile. So that when the, um, the storms that, that, that happen, the adversity that happens that we're seeing on a, a monthly basis, that we can absorb that and see opportunity in that. And so it's not when people say, you know, fragile, then we should be resilient. No, resilient just means that we kind of go forward and we don't change what we're doing based on what else is happening. Uh, what we want to do is create people who acknowledge this adversity, acknowledge this randomness, and acknowledge this 
you know, uncertainty. And then they get stronger with that. So if you think about it, fragile is the negative condition, resilience is the neutral condition. We want people who are in the positive condition, that being anti-fragile. And by that, we mean people, teams, organizations, that grow when exposed to volatility and randomness and disorder and stressors. And they love adventure, risk, and uncertainty. They see this as an opportunity. It, the endorphins start to be released in their body. They get excited about it. And um, you know, you often see this in sports with people when the going gets tough and things get crazy, they get better. And that's what we want to do with uh, people in society. And so adversity is an opportunity that makes us stronger. It doesn't, not only doesn't weaken us, it doesn't just keep us like marching forward and ignoring it. It excites us and makes us stronger. So even within that, I'm going to, you know, talk about, you know, the types of organizations that we start, whether they're startups or they're within larger organizations or they're not for profits or whether they're in government or academic institutions, you know, um, but mostly this evolved when I was looking at startups to begin with. And the first type of startup that people immediately associate entrepreneurship with is SMEs, small medium enterprises. These are uh, organizations that have a local market focus. These are what you, you know, people immediately associate with, be it a restaurant, be it a nail salon, be it a dry cleaner, be it an IT services company that's in your neighborhood and basically someone comes out and does something for you. Um, we refer to these as service companies or body shops where you need a body to perform the business. Um, they, what's the key factor, however, is that they focus on a local market. Um, and these are good for a, a, an economy and they produce um, clear kind of cause and effect. If I'm a, if I'm a, a dentist, and I and I'm, I'm that means I'm an entrepreneur. I'm serving the local market. I'm creating value for them, and I'm getting paid in return, so I can have this business grow and sustain itself. Then, um, if I just add some more resources to that, another chair, I will see more revenue very, very quickly, and all things being equal, more profit. So um, it is a very kind of linear growth, and it's very quick in time. Uh, in time, it, it cause and effect are tied together. So delta T, that means that this response time of the system is very short. They don't have a tremendous amount of inertia, these systems. Um, they grow very clearly, you know, with, with cause and effects tight, tightly tied. And then they, um, but they're capped out. But the good news is they don't require a lot of investment and they're less risky than what we're gonna talk about next, which is IDE, Innovation Driven Enterprise uh, Organizations, or what we call IDE Entrepreneurship. These are more complicated. These are trying to produce a product that others will use well beyond the local market, super regional, global market focus. And the, these people um, do something that's more than just a body. It, there's something that they have that's replicatable that differentiates them from other people. And now when you look at this system from a graphical standpoint, you'll see that you, you have to have this kind of dip at the beginning because you have to invest resources, be it money from, from yourself or other people, be it your time and effort where you don't get paid. Something has to be invested in it to create that special thing that will allow you to sell it to many other people. And uh, that right there is risky. That is risky. That means that it does not respond as quickly. The, the time response is, is longer. Um, and it will require investment up front, looking at uh, bullet number three. And you don't know whether it's going to work on the outside because it, cause and effect are not tight, tightly coupled here. Um, and so it, uh, it's riskier. But if you get it right, you have the ability for exponential growth that's uncapped. These two things, and the reason why I talk about this is because, you know, we often, when we talk about entrepreneurship, get pinned on the left, and that is entrepreneurship, and it's good, but what we're really going to focus is on the right, because the right is what, you know, 
the SMEs kind of provide, provide a stability for a, for a society. But it's the ones on the right that really transform an economy and really solve the, the most intractable problems of society. And you have to think about it differently when it's on the right, because there's more risk involved. You're going to have to think about how the equity structure, you're, you're really going to have to think more about products than on the left where you're thinking about services. So um, when we talk about this term innovation, and this is used uh, quite a bit today, I think it's worth defining that as well, because that has gotten to the point where it's almost meaningless. Um, and I think if we dive into it and look at some of the historical um, research on this and discussions, it, it's worth it. And so when we talk about innovation, people often equate it with invention. It's, invention is something new to the world. I have a patent, I have a technology, I have an idea. Um, that is not the same thing, just to be clear. Uh, invention costs you money. Innovation makes you money. Let me, let me repeat. Invention takes resources and does not necessarily give you return back for it. It's just the idea, the technology, the patent. Innovation is something that creates value. So the units are not correct here and something's missing. And what's missing is commercialization. Commercialization being how do I take that invention and figure out where I apply it in the world that it then does create the innovation and create value for someone in the world that ultimately an entrepreneur can um, monetize in some way, shape, or form. Um, by the way, when I'm talking about this, I'm not al always talking about for-profit organizations, as we'll get to later. You can be a nonprofit, and all of this fundamental kind of first principles work for you and help you make, a, make you a better social entrepreneur, as we've seen at MIT. Now, when we look at this equation, innovation equals invention times commercialization, um, we as a society over-index for invention. We love to talk about patents, PhDs, you know, how disruptive innovation, but in we under-index, that means we undervalue the commercialization. In fact, I would make the argument that the commercialization is where we as a society need to start indexing much higher. We need to put more emphasis on that. And that's really the role of the entrepreneur. And let me just give you some examples. There's plenty of inventions, technologies, and patents in the world, but there's not enough people to commercialize it. And when you look where the real value has been created, the real impact in the world, it has been through people who are extraordinarily good commercial, commercializers. Um, you know, the greatest uh, innovative company of our past decade has been Apple. And when you look at Apple, they have, um, they didn't invent, you know, the technology behind the Macintosh. They didn't invent the technology behind the iPod or the iPhone. They took that technology from Xerox Park, from Fraunhofer, who could not, who could not commercialize it. And then they commercialized it and they brought it to market. And that's where, that's why they're a trillion dollar company today. And the other companies um, you probably haven't even heard of, or they've essentially gone out of business. Um, the, and likewise, when you continue to look at you know, Facebook, was that a new idea? Absolutely not. There was a MySpace and Friendster before that, but they knew, figured out how to commercialize it. And Google, just to have three big ones that you see today, um, the, the fundamental idea behind Google came from the AdWords. And AdWords was not something they invented themselves. They actually got that from Overture, Bill Gross uh, at Overture, and then they were the ones who effectively commercialized it. So here's my point of the slide is um, commercialization is incredibly important. And there's lots of inventions out there. And the entrepreneur is very involved in that commercialization process. And while it's much harder to define and measure than the invention, it is hugely important as we think about entrepreneurship. And so the last point I wanna make in, in kind of this very specific definition is, um, it's not just having invention capability and it's not just having commercialization capability and then multiplying those two together and saying, aha, there we have innovation and therefore we're going to have a great company. Um, it it's actually has to do with the clock speed between them. 
And it's how quickly you can take an invention and iterate on it over and over again. So it's not we just have an invention and we throw it over once from the inventor to the person who commercializes and then they throw it back and they're a, a voila, Eureka, we have, we have something. When we look at entrepreneurial ventures, it is much, it's much more them going back and forth and back and forth between them over and over again. The, the times that they can iterate on this is critically important. And uh, Edison defined this very well uh, by saying, um, I think of innovation as the number of times I can iterate on a new idea within the first 24 hours when I have it. And so let me just give you one example of this. At, at, at IBM, when I worked there, and you can see this movie called Silicon Cowboys, uh, you may have lots of time now, um, it's on Netflix, but we at IBM had terrific invention capability. We had terrific commercialization capability. But what we did not have is the way to keep those working together to get things to market. On the other hand, Compact Computer, this small company that was just getting off the ground in Texas, you know, with inferior invention capability, inferior commercialization capability, um, if you looked at them standalone, um, they just blew IBM away, <laughs> excuse me, from a, um, in the personal computer market. And why was that? Because they could see what was happening, they could go back into the invention and make changes to it, come back to the market, see, oh, the market that likes this, it doesn't like that. They could do it again, and they could iterate much faster than we at IBM could do. I was there saying, hey, we need to make this change. And I knew that it would take months, if not a year, to get that product to market because we were not um, rapid in our ability to iterate between invention and commercialization. So that's, those are kind of the fundamental premises that I like to define entrepreneurship uh, so that everybody understands it. And, and, and what I also want to do now is just to um, say what it is not, because, you know, this will clarify as much as what I said, what it's not. And I just want to tell you, it's actually nine whopping lies that are told about entrepreneurs um, and often by entrepreneurs, which are not true. Uh, the first one is entrepreneurs are mercurial individuals. You might see this uh, from the social network movie with Mark Zuckerberg or the Steve Jobs movie. Um, this is not true. The data shows very compellingly that your odds of success are higher when you have a team as opposed to an individual. And so, and this makes all kinds of sense, especially in today's more complicated world. Um, the single soul genius is much less powerful than the collective wisdom and, LX and even more execution capability of the team. So entrepreneurship is not an individual sport, it's a team sport. And once you realize that, that it's a team sport, then you better not be um, a jerk and, and you know, like you see these other things and kind of dictate to people, this is what we do. You have to be able to have strong people and have discussion about ideas and make decisions, but you need a team to create value. Uh, individuals do not create value, it's teams that create value. And once you understand that, you realize you need to build teams and being um, a, 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 a irascible individual is not going to make you successful. Secondly, you know, you have to be really, really smart to be an entrepreneur. This is not true either. You need to have, you know, a level of intelligence, but it's more about uh, not just a passion, as Brad Fellows, it's obsession. I, I want to know everything there is to know about this, uh, be it, you know, uh, forced 3D force feedback when I was at Sensible, or, you know, identity solutions, or, you know, system dynamics in the educational environment. It, it's not how smart you are. It's not what you've achieved outside. It's more your ability to focus and do something really, really well for your customers that they will value and they see you as someone who's gonna bring them um, high quality products that will create value for them. So um, don't worry about, you know, that the smartest person wins or the person who has the most credentials or the most achievement in the past, none of that matters. Well, the only thing that matters is what's going on today and can you create value for your customer. And, and, and a third one is I, I'm not an entrepreneur because I don't have those genes. Entrepreneurship is not, is not nature, it is nurture. 
And we see this over and over again. Studies show that if your parents are entrepreneurs, that doesn't make you more likely to be a successful entrepreneur. It has nothing to do with the gene pool. It has everything to do with your exposure and your willingness to work. And as I go back to point number one, find a team that you can achieve your goals together. So don't buy it when people say, well, I'm just not an entrepreneur. Not true. I see it every day in, in, in class. People who, who other people wouldn't think are entrepreneurs actually turn out to be fantastic entrepreneurs because they're, because they're disciplined and they embrace the principles we're going to talk to you about. I can't be an entrepreneur because I don't like risk. Um, I'm an entrepreneur, and I know many, many, many entrepreneurs, and we don't like stupid risk. Uh, that's just crazy, like what we're talking about here. And um, we like intelligent risk, where we can do something where the odds are in our favor. And the example I always give is the um, MIT Blackjack team about how people say, wow, you know, look, look at all the risks they took. They didn't take risk, really. Um, oh, I'm sorry, they took informed risk. They didn't take stupid risk. They took informed risk. And, and I'm going to tell you, everybody today learns the how to need to take informed risk because there is no place in the world where there is no risk. So what the MIT Blackjack team do? They went to casinos and they played only one game. They didn't play this. They didn't play the one-armed bandit. They played blackjack. And why did they play blackjack? Because blackjack you know, has the, the closest thing to good odds. And it's something where you can make decisions that affect the outcome. And then the third thing is if you count the cards, the odds actually flip to be in your favor. And so what they did is they would go into a casino and they had trained very, very rigorously. And they would go into a casino and they would go in as a team, again, entrepreneurship, a team sport. They would go in and they would put two people at the table, and then they'd have two other people walking around to signal to them what the, um, what the card count was, because they have cameras of watching people at the table, so they can definitely not count cards. And they're also watching who they're interacting with. But interestingly, one of those people on the blackjack team was a female. And what they realized that nobody else realized was that the people in the casino did not believe that women could or would count cards and then be part of such a scheme. And so here's the, here's the upshot of it. The MIT blackjack team knew that there was risk in playing blackjack, you know, from an odd standpoint, but if they could flip the odds in their favor, they were take, willing to take that risk. But they had this insight that nobody else had. They had a, information asymmetry that, they didn't look at women. And so the women they, the, the, that they had on their team would count the cards and convey that information back to the people at the table so they could flip the odds in their favor. And we're gonna talk more about this is that's what entrepreneurs do. They learn how to have some advantage that flips the odds in their favor so the risk reward uh, equation is now in their favor as opposed to the other side. So um, look, entrepreneurs, don't take stupid risk. We take very intelligent risk and worthwhile risk. And if you don't, if you don't want to take any risk, then you're not going to exist in this world anymore. This world today has risk. And the question is, how are you going to deal with it as opposed to avoid it? Number five, I can't be an entrepreneur. They're so charismatic. You know, they can sell uh, ice to Eskimos. Uh, that's not, you know, let me just go back to that. I know there's a perception out there about this, but um, if you think about this for any period of time, you'll realize that it's not true. Entrepreneurs have to build up a good reputation. And if they sell something to someone and it's not good for them, then that person will tell other, will not be happy, will tell other people, they'll write bad reviews. And basically, the, 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 the pond will now be poisoned and they won't be able to sell anymore. And that won't create a sustainable business. It's not about you know, manipulating people to get them to do what you want. You have to create real value and they have to you know, realize that real value. And then they will tell other people about it because at the end of the day, word of mouth is the number one driver for entrepreneurs. So you do need to have someone who interacts with customers understands it, and then sells them that this is good for them, but 
it's not about a manipulation and charisma exercise. In fact, some of the best salespeople are the ones who are the most authentic, the most systematic, and just kind of logical in how they tell their, their story and explain your product. Um, number six, entrepreneurs are, are lucky. Um, and that's how it happens. This is not how uh, you know, it works. As, as someone once said, luck uh, favors the prepared. And so what is the prepared in this case? The prepared are people who see an opportunity coming. And then as Malcolm Gladwell says in the book Outliers, they spend 10,000 hours getting ready for when that opportunity is going to happen. And then they're there with it. Be it you know, Bill Gates and Bill Joy with understanding computers because they knew that computers were going to actually be this big thing and be on everyone's desktop at some point. Um, and so they spent their 10,000 hours, 10,000 hours being a, a kind of, a metaphor or a, you know, kind of a summary of how, how you have to work very hard to do that. Um, or, what, or it was ad mods saying, you know what, everyone's gonna have a phone soon and, and this advertising, that's gonna enable, you know, kind of geolocation advertising. And let's get going on this now because that's gonna happen in three or four years. And they do it and they create this, you know, this company that's a, the first, to, not the first to market, but the first with a viable solution that does a really good job. And they just, you know, everyone goes, oh my God, look at how lucky they are. They just got bought for hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, no, it was because they anticipated when the opportunity was gonna happen. And then they did their 10,000 hour work so that with those two uh, men. Um, entrepreneurs, uh, number seven, are, are undisciplined. This is a myth that is just, um, I, I, I believed it. You know, I thought, wow, it'd be great to be an entrepreneur. You don't have someone, you know, telling you what to do. You can kind of do your own thing. Um, let me just give you my personal story. So I think it makes it really clear. I was at IBM for 11 years and every day I would get in before eight o'clock. So I was there, I'd have my desk perfectly organized. My boss came in, I'd have everything ready and we would kind of go through the day and then he, he or she would leave and then I would leave after them and I'd be all organized for the next one. I wore a Brooks Brothers suit, starched every day, red tie. At meetings, I always showed up five minutes early, said the right things and uh, took good notes. And then um, I started my own company. I thought I was the epitome of discipline and this was gonna make all the difference in the new company. Well, I, I started my new company. I realized none of that mattered at all. The only thing that mattered the only thing that mattered was did we make a product that our customers wanted and then they liked it so much they paid us and, and then they would buy more and tell other people about it. That's the only thing that really mattered. It didn't matter what, you know, how we dressed and all this other stuff. That was, that was what mattered because if we didn't do that, we didn't make payroll. And that was just really very simple and very clarifying because at IBM, Payroll was just a given. It came from God above, twice a month down. And so we, we, I did, we never saw the link between these things. But in a startup, that link becomes incredibly clear and it creates an incredible amount of self-discipline in you to get the job done, to keep the main thing the main thing, and that is getting the product to the customer and making them happy. And everything else becomes secondary to that and must support that. So when you look at entrepreneurs, you might be, you know, the way they dress, the way they talk or something like that, but they must have incredible self-discipline to get the main thing done. And that's what successful entrepreneurs do. The other misperceptions, just to kind of go here, is that the big companies win. You know, entrepreneur, entrepreneurs don't win very often. And here's another book that I encourage you, or actually just, you don't need to read the book, just go watch the TED Talk, about David and Goliath. David and Goliath being this biblical story about how Goliath is this giant and nobody wants to fight him. And then all of a sudden, you know, they get, not all of a sudden, they finally convince David to fight him. And David's tiny. And it's like, how is he going to fight Goliath? And Goliath says, come out and fight me. I'll squish you like a bug, you know? And David says, uh-uh, I'm not playing by your rules. I'm going to play by my rules. And my rules are, I got a, I got a slingshot. And I'm going to run around and shoot it at you. And he's like, no, no, no come out here and fight me later. He's like, no, 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 no. I'm changing the rules right now and I'm going to play this way. And when playing this way, um, by changing the rules, Goliath's biggest asset, his size, his strengths, becomes his biggest liability because he is a big target if you have a slingshot 
and he's immobile to run around and duck in the trees and, and other places. And so he gets fallen. David, the underdog, wins because he changes the rules. He said, wow, that's a crazy story. That's a really unusual. Actually, no, it isn't. And, and that's what Malcolm Gladwell goes through in this book. In military operations, over 60% of the time, about two thirds of the time, you know, the, the David, if he ch changes the rules, ends up winning against the Goliath. So it's not that, you know, I know you hear all oh, startups fail at 90%, only, you know, 1%. At MIT now, currently, we did a study, 75% of our startups, those people who knew how to change the rules of the game, who had discipline, who knew all the first principles, they are succeeding at a very high rate. Now, I'm not saying that's for everyone because we have an extraordinary student body. But what I'm telling you is the odds are not nearly as bad as what people will have you believe. The last thing I want to say is that the idea is, I don't have an idea to do a startup. The idea is the single most overrated thing in entrepreneurship. Yes, you must have an idea. And I, it always kind of, and I used to sit there and say, oh, you know, Jesus, you, this isn't a good idea, this isn't a good idea. And it made me feel good. And one of the people I totally didn't have such a great idea was a guy named Ryan Hudson. Well, Ryan went out and just sold honey um, for $4 billion. So that tells you how much I know. What's much more important, and Mark, Matt Marx's research showed this, is you have an idea to get started and you build a team that believes in this common vision of what, what this idea is about. We're gonna get, talk about this later, a raison d'etre. You know, why are we in this together? What are we trying to accomplish? And then you kind of figure out who your customer is, that's the market aspect of this. And then you have a process where you do, what Matt Marx says it's called switchbacks, and you figure out what is it that they need and that we can do for them that's consistent with our common vision and, and then execute against that with excellence to create value for them that's aligned with what you wanna do. And the most important thing has nothing to do with the idea. The most important, you know, more important than the idea is who, who's your customer, figuring that out. But more important than even who's your customer is how do you execute against that, which, which is much more important than the idea and even who is your customer. And the most important thing of all is the team, that you have a good team. And I, and, you know, I have all the time people come and say, hey, you know, should, I, should I change my idea? And I say, that, that's easy. The, the harder question is, should you change your team? And um, let's talk a little bit about that. And they're a little taken aback by it. But clearly, you know, the quality of your team is a much better indicator of success than the quality of your idea. And the quality of your um, who, no, you know, clarity of knowing who your customer is much more important than your idea. And, and the quality of your execution process is, is, is much more important than your idea as well. So that's what this picture is about here to show, you know, proportionally how, you know, which one's the most important. And the big takeaway is the idea is necessary to get things started, but it changes over time. And it's the least important of all the factors that we've just talked about. Last thing I just want to say is, in thinking about, um, you know, how we're going to teach entrepreneurship, I just want to kind of go through and, and talk about what is entrepreneurship, because this was a really important insight to me. Um, so let me just go, first of all, you know, what is entrepreneurship? I think we've gone through that, um, and I'll have a little bit more here. Can it be taught? Yes. And I... I it, the data shows that, uh, first of all, you can learn to be a better entrepreneur because the more times you're an entrepreneur, the more likely your odds are of being successful, which the research shows and just intuition shows. My first company, not very successful. My second company, much more successful. My third company, much, much more successful. And you just learn it. So it can be taught. And the question is, how do you teach it? And people say, well, give me the algorithm. And uh, I, I'll, I, that's what I want to know. And is that, that's what the 24 steps is. And I have to say, no, entrepreneurship is not a science. And it will never be a science because it is not something that's deterministic, where if you do A and you do B, that you will get C. It's not like a theorem that's been proven before. and You just have to reprove it again. Um, the, the very nature of entrepreneurship is you're doing something that's never been done before. And so there can be no algorithm to do something that's never been done before because no one's ever been there before. 
You can't say, here's how you get there. When no one's, you're, the goal of being an entrepreneur is to do something that's novel and new. But on the other hand, so it's not a science. So that means, oh my God, you know, there's no hope here. It's, it's like art. It's only for a chosen few, elite few who know, who can kind of understand the feelings of how to paint and sing and do other things like that. That's not, that's not the case either. So it's neither science nor art in my humble view. It's a craft. It's a craft like pottery. And, and why do I say pottery? Be I say pottery because pottery is something that's accessible to everyone. Everyone can do pottery. And, and, and when you do it, you build something and you build something that's unique. Everybody would build something different if we taught a pottery class. Um, but we can make them better. There are first principles that we can teach them how to use your thumb, how to spin the wheel, how to kind of lift it off the, 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 the tray, how to put it in the oven, how to paint it and the like. So we can teach you those first principles and that will make you better, but it doesn't guarantee you of great success. You will only learn that by applying the first principles in an apprenticeship mode over time. And that's how you will get to be successful. And so when I think of entrepreneurship, I think the most helpful way to think about this is it's not a science, it's not art, it's a craft that has these different characteristics. And in that way, you will not get frustrated by looking for this you know, holy grail of entrepreneurship, and you won't get you know, distracted or misled by it. On the other hand, you don't feel that it's something you can't achieve either. And then this is the way we have to teach it. And this apprenticeship mode, you can't just learn through theory. It's theory, practice, theory, practice, over and over again, iteration. So, um, so that's what is entrepreneurship. How can it be, uh, can it be taught? The answer is yes. And, and by the way, um, people say, well, can it be taught to it? You know, it, it can be taught to anybody. I, I, I know this for a fact, and I know what it is. I've traveled around the world. And just think for a second, you know, when I go to Vietnam, everyone's an entrepreneur there in North Vietnam. Well, well, everyone who has to be, because people just figure out over the, the history of time, people have always been able to be SME entrepreneurs, you know? And so everybody can be an entrepreneur. And once you realize you can be an entrepreneur, we can help make you better and better. So let's talk about how do we, how do we teach that? Let me just see how we're doing for time. So, what we focus on are the four H's of entrepreneurship education. Um, and this starts with the heart. To be a successful entrepreneur, you have to have the mindset, you have to have the heart, the spirit to be an entrepreneur. We say the bird must sing from within. And to be an entrepreneur, you have to be you know, willing, and not just willing, but joyous to swim the other way. If all the fish are swimming this way, you're willing to swim that way, as you can see in the picture here. And this is what we call at MIT hacking the system, but hacking has connotations outside of MIT that aren't good. So we call it creative irreverence. Are you willing to be different or are you just gonna go along and get along? So, um, and this is what we talk about, you know, being uh, a pirate. It's more fun to be a pirate than to join the Navy. And you can see in our logo, the pirate ships and how it comes down here. And that's an important part. We want people to feel comfortable to be joyous about trying to do something different, even if it doesn't work. But, but don't just do the same old, same old. Um, but it's not enough to just say, hey, be a pirate. You have to, if you're gonna send people into battle, they have to have the spirit, but they have to have skills too. So what we do in our program is to um, give people the spirit of a pirate and simultaneously give them the execution skills of a Navy SEAL. So you have to be willing to be different, but then once you're different, you have to have total focus and discipline to be able to folk, to get the job done that you're, you're setting out to do. And how do we do that? So first of all, to give them the skills, you have to have the knowledge, that's the head. So it starts with the heart, it goes to the head. Do you know what to do? And we have um, the first principles we've codified well beyond storytelling, and I'm just gonna, it, to build a toolkit to help you be a successful entrepreneur. If you were gonna build a house, a very unsophisticated relative to entrepreneur, a, a, a system, uh, you would have a toolbox. No one would say you can build it with one tool. Um, 
Yet, when you look at the history of entrepreneurship, there have been too many times where people are looking for a singular tool that will help them be a successful entrepreneur. That will always fail. So you, we have to have this kind of mindset that says, what are all the tools that we're gonna put in our toolbox? And that's what we've done here. And that we call it an open source type of system. It comes from all these books have something good or multiple things that are good about them. And then we put that, those are tools that we will then put into the toolbox. But before we put them into the toolbox, we look at them with a level of rigor and kind of make sure that they meet standards of excellence and, and, and uh, you know, data-driven analysis, evidence-based that we, that we feel is legitimate. And uh, this is how you create a body of knowledge. This is how you create it. No one person is going to do that. So what we've done is we've pulled together lots of different things from lots of different places around the world, and, um, and we're going to incorporate it. But we're obsessed with no singular one. It's the system. It's the approach that we're doing. It's the toolkit that's most important. And so what we're going to do here is I, I'll leave this in here for you is a slide. But there's a whole other, you can dive down in many parts of entrepreneurship. Um, and I'm going to focus on how do we get product market fit? Because if you don't have a product, you're not going to get that exponential growth. And so what we've done through a kind of the approach is pull together, starting with things like design thinking, but also what Procter & Gamble has done in the real world, to think about how do you get started? And how you get started is with who is your customer? And each one of the steps here is very systematic, defined as to what do you do next? This is sequential, but not linear. It tells you, here's the steps that you should go through, but there's lots, well, I say it's not linear because there's lots of iteration between the steps. So you're going one to the, oh, I gotta go back to the other one. So first we look at who is your customer because it's not, you don't wanna focus as Simon Sinek says on the how and the what, you wanna focus on the why, but the why depends on the who. So we're gonna look at this as many successful entrepreneurs have shown over time in Procter & Gamble, who is your customer? What's the demographic psychographic? And then we look at what can we do for that customer and break it down using full life cycle use case, um, high level product specification, don't build the product. I've written about this and I'll, I'll give you my website. Come up with a high level product specification, much easier to iterate with this and then figure out what your value proposition is based off the why of your customer, and then refine that with the next 10 customers, and then figure out what's, what's unique. And so all of this stuff, I, I'm gonna go through relatively quickly because I have a whole you know, online courses and books on this and, and a website that you can go to. But this tells you, you know, who's your customer? What can you do for your customer? But you've created no value until they acquire the product. So how do they acquire it? What's the jury? What's the process they go through to do that? Um, and then you, we look at, okay, so we know who our customer is, how we create value for them, how they acquire it, but how are we going to go to market? How are we going to make money off this? How are we going to extract rent? How, how much can we extract? Um, how, how much is it going to cost us? And this is what we call the lifetime value of the customer relative to the cost of customer acquisition. And then we look at um, how do you build the product later? And this is, you know, often people want to build it earlier in the process I, as a terrible idea. And, you know, I've written about that. You can go see that, our dangerous obsession with the MVP. And then ultimately you will have to build a scalable business where you have a beachhead market, but you land and you expand from there. And how do you do that? So this is kind of our a structured knowledge way that we go about doing this for one part of this, it's open, it's open. We get from everyone. There's no singular person who has the answer, singular institution. Um, it's, it's open sourced as well. It's, it's comprehensive, but it's practical for this part of the process. It's integrated. It's, as I said, it's proven and tested because of what we've done. And we have practitioners and academics looking at this over and over again. And it's sequential and it tells you where to start, but it's not linear. And the thing that I didn't realize at the beginning, it creates a common language for people so that when entrepreneurs in our community start talking to each other, they can share knowledge and build knowledge. So 
that's the knowledge, but it's the apprenticeship model, it needs to be applied. And so at MIT, we have a, a very systematic um, apprenticeship model where they go from inspiration to exploration to go into the classroom, then to apply it outside of it. Um, and then they iterate many times through the theory that they get in the classroom and the practice outside of it and the lines between the classroom and the co-curricular extracurricular get very, very fuzzy here. But this is really where a lot of learning happens. And if they have a good team and, they, and they, they're starting to see some traction, then they get into our acceleration program, our Delta B, and then they achieve escape velocity at that point. And if you go through this whole cycle, um, the rate of success, as I mentioned, is 75% that you will be in business. And I would say it's 100% that you have, we have increased their anti-fragility quotient as humans. Um, and we repeat this every year uh, uh, over and over and we refine it and make the process better. So we start with, yes, I can. Then we move to, okay, let's, let's increase the exposure. And then they're starting to commit. And now they jump in the race. They're on the field. They're on the court. They start to play. And then the people who do really well get, get full immersion. And those are the people who we bring back to be the inspiration for the people the next year that, yes, you can do it. And uh, that's working really well. And let me just say that it, the, the point of these slides is it's not a linear process. What we do in, in, in an academic institution is provide a safe space where people can kind of move around and with new ideas and new teams and try things out. And ultimately, after probably a two-year time period, they are uh, entrepreneurs, whether they're, they've started their own company or not they're dramatically more anti-fragile than they were at the beginning and they know how to deal with ambiguity, uncertainty, um, risks, and adversity. Um, and it's very important, as I mentioned, that they, they continue to develop their teams throughout this process. So that's the heart, the head, the hand. What's the last one? Um, and that is probably the least uh, understood one and the one that came to me last was home, the importance of a community. And you know, we always say the strength of the pack is in the wolf. Each wolf needs to be strong, but the strength of the wolf is in the pack. So what we learn is, is, is learned is that entrepreneurs are very good at working with other people in communities, creating good communities, and then maintaining those communities, and then being strong members of those communities. And what that means is it's not just a, you know, a, a socialist kind of exercise. It means if, if you want to be part of our community, you better give and you can take, but you better give. You can't just be a taker. And if you're just a taker, we're going to exclude you from the community. And everybody must bring something to that. And this is much better than the command and control I had at IBM, where you had to own the whole team, you had to control it, and that team would lose, as you saw with Compact and, and Silicon Cowboys, to a team where they were working with other people and they were bartering services and they had a much more dynamic distributed way of doing business. And so um, this is the community aspect of what we do. So let me just talk briefly about, um, in the final minutes I have here, is about social entrepreneurship. And what I learned from the first book, which you'll see is the white book called Disciplined Entrepreneurship, and um, it has different names uh, in, in, in French, but basically it's Disciplined Entrepreneurship, the first book I did. And the second book um, of the Disciplined Entrepreneurship Workbook is that in looking at it, people wanted to have a canvas and how to think about their business. And you can see the 24 steps are included here. You know, who's your customer? What can you do for your customer? What makes you different? Steps 10 and 11. Um, and then... You have, how do you acquire your process, 12 and 13? You know, how do you make money off it? And then how do you go to market? And then, but there, and then how do you build it over here? And then how do you scale it? But there are these other things like, you know, we didn't incorporate in the 24 steps. How do you pay for the R&D expense? How do you pay for the GNA? Um, so, but more than that, I want to go back to the first part of this. And that's this raison d'etre. A raison d'etre, meaning what's the reason for existence? And we tell our students this all the time. Why is the world going to be a better place because you're working for your company? I say, because we can make money. That is not a good reason. That's a, a, a mercenary reason. And it's not entrepreneurial ventures 
have to have a driving common vision that's more than just making money. Because if it's about making money, when it's going good, they'll stay with you. When it's not going good, then they'll go work at Goldman Sachs or they'll go work someplace else where they can make more money. They have to be in it for this common vision. And that is very, very important. And so we really emphasize, you know, with ours, what is the raison d'etre? Why are you working? Why is the world going to be a better place because of this? And that has proven to be a very effective way to kind of integrate uh, social entrepreneurship into all of our enterprises because uh, good friends, uh, Tom Byers of Stanford, you know, Laura Dunham of St. Thomas and John Field of, of um, Duke talk about entrepreneurship is at its core an ethical activity. That's what it is. And because it must be, because we're trying to get people to follow us and do something that might not always be rational. It might not always be the most economically sound decision. And so what we found here is this right up front, putting it in here and having that discussion before we jump into the mechanics of how do you become an entrepreneur are very, very important. Um, the last thing I just want to talk about is, you know, wow, you know, in this COVID-19 pandemic that's going on, everything's, you know, should we just go back and work at large companies? And, and, and the answer is no, never have we needed entrepreneurs more than we need entrepreneurs right now. Um, this is a disruption of the highest order. The world will never be the same. And the people who are going to solve this are, 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 are entrepreneurs, whether they exist in government, whether they exist in startups, whether they exist in big companies. We need people who are going to step up to this challenge. Uh, we would never have wished for this in a million years. This is how we wanted. But this is the reality, and we are where we are. It is what it is. And as we say in basketball, that's the, the ref just made that. That's what happened. Stop focusing on that. What's the next play we're going to do? And what's the next play we're doing in, in, uh, with COVID-19? So first of all, we're doubling down on the anti-fragile, you know, kind of. Um, that's what we've been set up for, but how do we make this real in today's world? And when we look at our students at MIT, it's shocked. They're, they literally are unmoored. They don't know what. They've had this idea of here's how they're going to end their college career, or here's how it's going, and that has all just been blown away. And they're trying to figure out where do we go now? What do we do next? And so what, what's needed more than ever right now is hope. That don't, don't worry, this will pass and we can do it. We are anti-fragile. We just got to put our head down and execute against this. So hope and confidence, and they need the strength to say, okay, let's lean on the things that we know and we're going to, we can, we can go forward. But even then, even the first principle we've taught, there still needs to be more guidance as the mentoring as to how do you do this? And then the fourth thing is that we're, is the community, the, the power of the community, not, not just for helping out to get the job done from a logistics resources standpoint, from emotional support, has never, ever been higher. And so um, what we're doing right now at MIT is we're implementing programs to do this. We just had the COVID challenge uh, this weekend where people uh, got on Zoom for the first time and we had a virtual hackathon as to what are things that we could do. We're not just going to sit here at home and watch Netflix 24 hours a day. What can we do to help battle this COVID-19? We're not going to be defeated by it. And um, that's the first movement this weekend. Uh, we also have put together an anti-fragile speaker series where we're having people come together. Um, and I worked on this all this weekend about, you know, what's decision making look like in a crisis? We have Jocko Willink, who literally trains Navy SEALs and was at one in life or death situations, because this is a life or death situation now. And then we had, uh, I have Billy Campbell talking about, you know, the last person on uh, the flight that landed in the Hudson, the last passenger with Sully. How do you make decisions in that life or death situation? So decision making in a crisis, how do you be mentally strong? How do you, how do you stay strong yourself in this crazy environment? And then how do we make ethical decisions? Um, again, with uh, Tom Byers, Laura Dunham, and John Field. You know, how, how do we use entrepreneurship, not for profiteering, but for good things? And then um, how do we come up with new ideas? What's creativity? How, where are the opportunities now? And then um, how do you position yourself as a business after this? How do you kind of lead a business uh, from an operational standpoint 
to get this done. And, um, and then where are the places that you can do this? You know, is it different now? So these are the types of things we're doing. We're, we're rewarding, celebrating anti-fragile heroes. Think what's going on right now before you just, you know, say it's hopeless. Zoom is, is just crushing it because they were there to have this video conferencing. They have a great user interface and I have no financial interest in Zoom, but it's amazing to see how this has not just happened for business, but for people's personal and social lives as well. Um, I have a son who's, who's a company that does um, a Peloton for rowing and his business is, is just going gangbusters now because people want to get that. So they want to get exercise equipment in their house where they're not gonna, they can keep social distance. Telemedicine, as you can imagine from today's. We have a company called Biobot Analytics that test has been, came out we, four years ago that tests for things like the Zika virus and now for COVID-19 in the sewers when people flush their toilet. Uh, so they can tell you proactively when things are starting to happen. And now they're on fire right now with people, if we had had them installed in lots of places, we would be in a much, much better position. Podometrics and rapid SOS, giving people kind of a, you, you don't necessarily even need the test. They can actually see where the, 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 the problem areas are starting to happen on maps. So here's my point is, there are lots of opportunities out there. And what we need to do is we need to turn a negative into a positive, like Biggie Small said. And um, that's what we fully intend to do. So that's what, uh, that's what entrepreneurship is. Um, that's, uh, it can be learned. Um, I hope you feel comfortable with that. Uh, you taught, showing you how it's, how it's done, how it's done in a social environment integrated with into the structures we have, and also why it's so important right now uh, in, the, in this pandemic, global pandemic we have that you, you stay true to social, uh, you stay true to entrepreneurship, uh, all of which is social entrepreneurship, and we can make a difference like never before. And this is not the end. The world is only going to get going faster and faster and faster. And there will be more challenges. And I encourage you to build up your entrepreneurial skill set. Thank you very much for having me. And good luck for the rest of the program. And um, I would encourage you, you know, if you're interested, um, go to uh, disciplinedentrepreneurship.com. It's D hyphen E ship is the short for that dot com. There's lots of materials there. There's free online courses. There's information about books, videos. Um, you can join the community. There's forums to ask questions. There's new material coming up all the time. And uh, hopefully I'll see you out there on that, that community platform. With that, take care. Um, stay safe and appreciate your loved ones. Thanks. Bye.